Welcome back. This is the time that you can interact with the doctor on the program. If you have questions concerning meningitis which bother you, you can call in on 0808-054-2233. That's 0808-054-2233. You can also tweet at CTV underscore Mary A. So we were talking about how it spread. Droplet infection, sneezing, coughing. Yes, yes. But how about if there's no sneezing and coughing? You mentioned crowded areas. Is there any other method? Okay. Um, in, the, in the very young children, like the neonates, it can be transmitted from the mother to the child. An infected mother can, during the birth process, can infect her baby. So a baby can come down with meningitis within the first few days during of life. During the birth process? Yes. Within the first few days of life, the patient, the baby can have um, these features, the fever, then they have convulsions, they have the full fontanel, like um, the anterior fontanel that is open is now under pressure. That yes, thing exactly. Is, uh, that beats exactly. On the head. It's so, going so to what happens elevated. to it? It's going to be elevated, look a little bit elevated. So that's the full fontanel. They have they could have seizures, convulsions, and the fever. And at that point they should present to the health facility immediately. If, if the mother is a carrier, for example, you know you said there are some people who don't uh, manifest, manifest it and they carry can she give it to her baby? Yes, from kissing, a lot of um, close contact. Yes, she can give it to her baby. So now a baby or let's say a very young child cannot tell you, maybe three years old, two years old, cannot say, uh, my neck is stiff, I feel hot, and all those things that older people can tell you. Yes. So for a mother, a new mother, what should she be looking at? Okay, your baby comes down with hotness of the body, that's fever. He could cry, he could cry about his head. Then he could have convulsions. He could have um, this excessive crying. You're trying to pacify him, he's not, he's just, then he's restless. These are pointers, something, something is different. And then it could be vomiting. The first thing is the appetite that goes, the appetite goes first. And um, then with these seizures, all oh, they should point you to something should present to the health facility at that point in time. Let's talk uh, in, in treatment. Let's first talk about when the, when the person is being treated at the hospital, what is given? Okay, we give intravenous antibiotics. Do they have to be intravenous? Yes, for bacterial meningitis, they have to be intravenous. Okay. To have, we are trying to get these antibiotics to cross the blood-brain barrier to the brain. Okay, that's why it's in Yes, that's why it's in can, can it be treated without leaving behind any ill effects, any, you know, vestiges of showing that the person has had meningitis before? Yes, if the person presents early and treatment is started, could have 100% um, treatment without any sequelae. But if the person presents late, maybe he has taken so much self-medication, he has come in very ill, already, maybe he already has neurological deficits already, when you're treating that, you're just trying to prevent further damage. What do you call neurological deficits? Okay, for example, deafness, visual defects, you could have recurrent seizures. Then you could have some intellectual disability, you could have um, even a stroke. Then um, you could have behavioral problems. These are all neurological deficits. And these things don't fade away after the treatment is completed? Um, some do not fade away. Say 50% of them have some sequelae. That's the neurological um, what we've talked about. You could have the hydrocephalus, the big head. That means the cerebrospinal fluid is not being reabsorbed as it should be because of the inflammatory processes that have gone on in the meninges. Or now there's now some fibrosis of the exit point for the cerebrospinal fluid. So the head expands, especially in children. And then they now require a neurosurgeon, neurosurgical procedure to divert the fluid. Okay. Let's uh, quickly take this phone call from Chris. Hello, Chris. Chris, are you with us? I think we've lost Chris. For this, uh, shall we say, outbreak that has taken place, that is taking place in the north, what would be your advice for families and people who have not got meningitis but need to be careful? Okay. For families in the north, they need the meningococcal vaccine and then um, they have to avoid overcrowding, avoid um, any living condition that is overcrowded. If People have to be a lot in the room. There should be proper ventilation. Then there should be just a minute. Not of infective origin. And it's, for example, by cancer. Is the cause of treatment going to be the same? Hello, Chris. Could you could you go over that one more time? 
Hello? I, I did not hear Chris. Were you able yeah, to hear that? Hear Please try again. Maybe we'll be able to hear you. You were talking about the precautions. Okay, yes. Then we said um, you should avoid overcrowding. If they have to be a lot in the room, there should be ventilation, cross ventilation. And then they should, they should practice hygienic practices, hand, just hand wash, hand, um, hand hygiene. And then um, basically that's it. But I'm curious, when you say they should take the vaccine, what age group of people are we talking about? Okay. Now we say, we say we're talking about the most common causes. There are three of them. We talked about the hemophilus influenza and then the streptococcus pneumonia. That affects the younger age groups, under fives. Then the one that's causing the epidemic is the meningitis and affects the older children. So we're talking about the meningococcal conjugate vaccine. That's what I'm talking about for those people, especially those living in camps, in boarding houses, in dormitories, yes, and then in the north. So they need to have the vaccines, avoid overcrowding, practice hand hygiene, and then um, ventilation. And then early presentation, if you have symptoms and then you suspect, present to the health facility early. What if somebody is 20 or 30 and in that belt, should they be concerned about themselves too? Yes, the vaccines go up to, in fact, say 1 to 29 years. Yes, they should have that. And, even the, and even the elderly too can have meningitis. See, so it's, it's a lot of money that is, uh, that is involved in, it, in this. What do you think should be done now for this, for this um, outbreak? I don't want to call it an epidemic. Okay, like what we're doing now, health education. It's very, very important. We need to educate the public, sensitize them that this is what meningitis, this is how it is transmitted, and this is how it can be prevented. And then we need to give them the vaccines everyone within that um belt within the region especially in the states that are very um affect, that are affected so much should have the vaccines as they are having right now and then um we still need to tell them about any presentation to the hospital if features are suggestive and then a lot of hygiene if you have if you're taking care of a patient that is ill you should ex um, ex you should ensure that you have wash your hands every time Every time you're around the person, you, you're true with the person, you should wash your hand. And then avoid overcrowding. And then if you have to be in a crowded environment, you should please have your vaccine. Okay. So if, if uh, somebody is traveling, for example, from here, maybe going to Sokoto, going to Zamfara, maybe someone like me. Because I, I'm thinking of, you know, not just really young people, 1 to 29. Would it be advisable? to first take a vaccine before traveling. Yes, if you're traveling, you should take a vaccine. Now we, we, we are talking about zero type C. Before it was A. <laughs> and they tell us A has gone down so low, you know, it's not so much of a problem. But now we're we are looking at C. How, how did it get here? <laughs> That's what we can't say so much. But there's a lot of um, population shuffling. People travel a lot. Some could have come from an area where that is the more um, prominent organism in its own area and then bring it over here and then it's spreading especially within the meningitis belt within the let period let me cut you there okay. just for a moment because chris has been trying to get to us hello chris hello chris hello i want to give you a moment here because you really try to come across hello, to us. I if, are you there uh, the cause of meningitis is not of uh for example, of cancer, okay. is the cost of treatment going to be the same? Okay. Whether the cause of treatment is going to be the same if the meningitis is from oh, cost cancer. of treatment. Okay, okay. No, not cost, as in the cost. What the kind of yes? Of what kind of treatment? The primary focus would be to treat the cancer, whatever is causing it, and um, um, yeah, because you, you know this is significant because. Perhaps you won't be talking about antibiotics, about intravenous antibiotics. So what will bring down the inflammation, really? Okay. Um, in cancer, we know also that the people with cancer have decreased immunity. They're immunocompromised. They're taking drugs, chemotherapy. So they're at risk of having infected so meningitis. what you're saying is that the person would most likely have an infection yes. already. Yes, and then we'll treat with IV antibiotics as well. But is there... Any time you have to treat with something else, like maybe just for a head trauma, maybe an, an accident and there's a swelling, but there's no invasion 
that how can you tell that there's no invasion? <laughs> that's it. But he has had an accident and then there's direct contact between the maybe he's even leaking several so fluid from the ears, he's had head trauma. So at that point, who we'll treat with IV antibiotics? But if we have someone that's had a drug reaction and but this you have to confirm this before you stick out your neck and say you would not use IV antibiotics. Okay. So um Yes, we were talking about the mutation of the of the um, organism. Organism is it is it really mutating, or we just haven't come in contact with other serotypes? Because there's the X, there's the W. Are there vaccines for those in other places? Yes, we have I'm, vaccines. I'm thinking of in case anything happens, you know, so they don't just start <laughs> saying let's make a vaccine now. Exactly, we have vaccines for all of them. The ones that cause epidemics, we have vaccines for all of them. But we have always had the serotype A, and this. Yeah, that is in, occurring in epidemic um, proportion, but this is now the serotype C. So the vaccines for C, we are bringing that they're, they're, I'm sure they are around right now. People are having them. Thank you very much, Dr. Olonam, for coming to the show. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being there with us and allowing us to be there with you. Thank you, Chris, for trying so hard. Have a wonderful day. I'm Mary Alale Yusuf.